Welcome to Chapter 5, the Book of Numbers, a chapter that is a little bit difficult to handle uh, until I believe we go through it and see some of the uh, uh, possibilities that explains this unusual chapter. It begins a separation of the unclean. Now, remember, this is 3,000 years ago that this was written with these people that came out of Egypt that basically now as a government being set up for these people by God. And so whatever God says to do, then that's what they need to do. Here and now we're 3,000 years in the future and a future of that time. And we have God not dealing with a people as such as one person, but speaking through the word of God, through the Jesus Christ that came, God in the flesh, and today us reading the book and the Bible and um, understanding the things that Jesus would uh, have us to do. And when he came, he offered uh, alternative uh, explanations to some of these things that were black and white to the people of the time of Moses and were became more of a, um, I don't know what you would call it, a, a gray area to where um, it, it became more the, the law rather than what was in the heart to do the right or the wrong thing. And so uh, here we'll go through this and we'll show, I believe, some of the things that differed with the New Testament thought in Old Testament here. And the Lord spoke to Moses saying, a sign, an imperative, a sign to the sons of Israel, and let them send out from out of the camp every leper and every one having, and you can add that to your English derivatives book, a gonorrhea, a gonorrhea or a bodily flow of uh, sexual n- nature because the gono has to do with the genitals, a genital flow basically, and every one unclean from a dead soul. So uh, now that doesn't mean they are going to be gone forever, but to take them, put them out until they are either cleansed in the case of the leper and having gonorrhea could take a while, could be healed and leper might never be healed. Uh, And so there, he would be out of the um, congregation of the Jews. Now, when Jesus came, he cleansed many lepers. There's stories of him cleansing 10 lepers in one place and so forth. And when he touched them, they became uh, clean. There was a a movie uh, called Risen, where uh, the centurion, I mean, it's a make-believe, but it was it was interesting how in one part it was very touching where this a leper was being uh, beaten and or shoved away and made fun of, kicked away from the camp, and yet Jesus went over and touched him and, and healed him. Uh, and so Jesus, uh, but the leprosy really wasn't, uh, the, what didn't find, out what was the cause of leprosy until, I think, until the 1800s, and then the cure was even later. But um, the leper was to be sent out. And then uh, everyone having the g- g- genital flow and every un- one unclean from a dead soul. So the unclean here, I believe, it, unclean, a cathartone, it's an interesting word. I did a study on it. It's the opposite of holy. You're holy. You can't be unclean if you're holy, and if you're un- if you're holy, if you're unclean, you can't be holy. Uh, and now the state can you have that state going back and forth? Um, I believe you can. I believe a believer can have an uncleanness and uh, can be a clean, be holy at one time and be unclean at another time. That's my opinion. I believe uh, the Bible shows that. I was just uh, conversing with a friend and showing how there her church was talking about demons where I showed where uh, a demon uh, in Luke 9 42 it says and while yet during his coming forward the young person the child the demon tore him and he flailed about and Jesus gave reproach to the unclean spirit so the demon tore him and Jesus gave reproach to the unclean spirit and healed the child and gave him back to his father so if a demon unclean spirit I see is throughout uh, the uh, New Testament and uh, many, many places. 
for this word. Only two places it has to do with foods. Every place else is unclean spirits. And I believe uh, anyone, believer or non-believer, can have an unclean spirit at some time or another. And I believe that Luke 9.42 shows that. And the unclean spirits um, doesn't, the, the demon, the problem is the word in demon and the in unclean spirit. And here in 942, it shows they're synonymous. They're the same thing because it said uh, the demon tore him uh, and Jesus gave reproach to the unclean spirit. So if you look in the Old Testament, you'll never, you hardly find, there's only four places that it mentions a demon, and I'm, that's in English. I'm not sure in Greek if it even is in Greek. So um, it's only four places you can look in your Strong's and find them. That's it. I, uh, demons are, are all, almost all mentioned in the New Testament. I don't know, 10, 20, 30 places, but it's equated to unclean spirits. Now, to the Old Testament people, understanding what an unclean spirit is is no problem. And the same thing in the New, New Testament, an unclean spirit. In fact, Jesus was charged uh, as having an unclean clean spirit, and that was in Mark 3.30 as he was talking about the sin against the Holy Spirit. If you say if somebody, if somebody has a Holy Spirit, you call them unclean, uh, then that's a sin against the Holy Spirit, and there's no, for, there's no forgiveness for that because basically you're in a position of being lost until you really do change. And the unclean spirits uh, in the New Testament, the disciples were given authority over these unclean spirits. So the unclean one uh, was not holy. And so this is what this chapter is dealing with. It says, from male unto female, you send them outside the camp. For in no way shall they defile the camp in which I occupy among them. And the sons of Israel did thus and sent them outside the camp. I added a period and then a new sentence. As the Lord said to Moses, thus the sons of Israel did. They obeyed. And the Lord spoke to Moses, saying, Speak to the sons of Israel in the imperative, saying, A man or woman, whoever should commit of all the sins of mankind, and ignoring should ignore, and that soul should trespass, he should declare openly the sin which he did, and shall give for the trespass offering the total sum and the fifth part of it he shall add unto it, and shall give back to whomever he trespassed to him. But if there might not, so if somebody ripped somebody off for 100 bucks, they got to give them 105 back. But if there might not be to the man uh, acting as next of kin, so as to give to him satisfaction for the trespass offering, uh, let the trespass offering be given to the Lord, uh, to be for the priest, besides the ram of the atonement, by which he shall atone with it for him. So this gets into the um, offerings and so forth and who you give it to. And um, so exactly how that next of kin fits into this, I don't know. <laughs> Some of these things are really difficult. Um, but somebody act, act generally an acting of next of kin is uh, somebody that has... Um, died, and then the uh, other person, a next of kin, uh, makes a reconciliation to whatever the person owed in different ways. And every first fruit of all the things having been sanctified among the sons of Israel, as many as they should offer to the Lord, will be for the priest himself, not to the priest. And the things of each man having been sanctified, has set apart as holy to the Lord, it will be his, that is, the priest and a man, whoever should give anything to the priest, to him it will be. No giving back. Priest has it. Now it changes to the law of uh, jealousy. Uh, now this word uh, says, uh, we'll get to the word here and I'll show you. And the Lord spoke to Moses saying, speak again in the imperative to the sons of Israel, and you shall say to them, now, I change this. It should be changed in the next edition. Um, a husband, a husband, if his wife should violate and overlooking, should ignore him, 
and anyone should go to bed with her in the marriage bed of semen, adultery, and it should be unaware from the eyes of her husband, and she should hide it, and she should be defiled, and there should be no witness against her, and she should not be conceived, then th- and there should come upon him, the husband, a spirit of jealousy, that own word only appears in the Old Testament, but in the New Testament, and he should be jealous of his wife, and she be defiled, or there should come upon him a spirit of jealousy, and he should be jealous of his wife, and she should not be defiled, uh, then the man shall lead the wife to the priest. And we'll get down here in a second before we'll go into this word jealousy. Uh, right here, it should be jealous. Now, this word has two meanings. It could be either, see, it's zelosi, zelosi. starts with a zeta. We have the word zealous and jealous. King James kind of made it separated the two, and maybe in this case it was uh, the best thing that they did do. Uh, normally, I don't like it when they split it up uh, into making a, one word some two different meanings, but sometimes it's valid, and here I believe it was. Uh, zealous uh, is different than jealous. A per, a zealous can be a, a good trait. You can be, in the New Testament, zealous uh, for good works, zealous uh, in your work, zealous to do things uh, for other people, uh, be zealous for God. Um, your zeal is for him. But now, if it's in the negative, it's something that's bad, well, there's a medium, a, a, a middle grounds too. In this place here, it's got the middle grounds. depends on if the person was you know, guilty or not, that the person jealous, being jealous over if the other person was either guilty or not, that's a middle ground. And then, of course, uh, then the jealous, if the um, is um, if the per- if, if they were if they were I guess if the, if they were guilty, then uh, the jealous jealousy would uh, fit. But um, jealousy uh, can exist now, not zealous, but jealous jealousy can exist either inside or outside of a marriage. Uh, it's an attitude problem, really. And uh, it depends, it, it deals with the behavior generally of affected by one's self, but by other people's uh, behavior. Jealousy outside of uh, the marriage didn't, there was no laws. You could be jealous if you wanted, you could be mad, you didn't have to go do sacrifices, you could be happy. All these is a part of an emotion. There was no law over that. But in the New Testament, uh, it says in 1 Corinthians 13, 4, love is lenient, is kind. Love is not jealous. So, uh, see here in the New Testament, it gives the, the, the jealous, uh, to be jealous, uh, the love should take over. Now, if somebody did do something to be jealous of, that's a different story and how you handle that, I suppose. But love should be preeminent in however you do, not vindictiveness. And then in James 4, 2, uh, it says, uh, you murder and are jealous and are not able to succeed. So jealousy uh, outside of a marriage can be something bad. A person could be jealous of another person's um, position in a church uh, and so forth uh, and um, get mad, leave the church, cause all kinds of problems within and without and all kinds of problems with jealousy of uh, other people and certain things. I mean, you could write a book on jealousy. Uh, the brothers of Joseph, it says, were jealous uh, over Joseph because he was the favorite of his father Jacob. They were so jealous of him that they sold him into slavery into Egypt. Now, it, what's dealing with here a jealousy is with the wife and the husband and um, in marriage. And uh, a lot of times, I think what it's getting to here, um, the reason for a jealous, um, a, a person can be jealous. Uh, sometimes a person can be doing something that is wrong in the relationship and 
uh, project it onto the spouse and accuse the spouse of doing the same thing. This is fairly common. It happens quite a bit. Sure, if you talk to psychiatrists and go to places that deal with this, uh, you would see that this, this happens quite often. In fact, they even made a movie out of it, and I saw it years ago. It was called Paris, Texas. It was about a man who had a wonderful relationship with his wife and children, but uh, he was, I think, had re- illicit relations himself, and then he started seeing things about his wife and became jealous and looking at everything that she did uh, as what he would, was doing and ended up ruining the relationship and lost the family. That, and the story was all about him being so broken that he started walking and he's out in the wilderness uh, in the desert in, in, in Texas and his brother goes looking for him to find him. Uh, and the whole story goes on how he deals with this jealousy, and at the end, and uh, it's an it's a good movie, for a good movie, I thought, uh, and um, so that was a case of uh, projecting uh, your uh, the, the, on somebody else. Now, there's other things that can a person can cause another person to become jealous uh, if they uh, a spouse uh, acts in an unorthodox way, leading one to think uh, either a truth or a falsehood, either thinking, well, that person is doing this, something's going on wrong, maybe he's got an affair going, or um, it, or he, or, or it's true, he is having an affair. So uh, either way, um, the unorthodox behavior is somebody that's doing something that would lead somebody else to question the relationship is a problem, and that's another big problem, as in, I'm sure psychologists run across all the time. I used to be a psychiatric technician back in the 1960s for a couple of years in a mental hospital, so I know a little bit about it. I know I was more messed up than the people in the hospital, and the people, psychiatric technicians were taking the drugs, this is the 60s, taking the drugs from the patients, taking them for themselves and giving them placebos, and the, the people knew and they would get really mad. They didn't get their drug, and it was really a mess. And then a lot of uh, a lot of stuff going on in the in the, in the field. I could I could write a I would go through a lot of this, but I'm but I'm not. But uh, so anyway, the behavior of people. Another a person could be flirting with the opposite sex, just be a flirtatious person, and um, whenever they see somebody of the opposite sex over over friendly than the other person would be that's uh, jealous and uh, that per- looks at that and thinks, well, you know, what's this all about? You don't care about me and you don't act like this about around me. You're not so excited, but yet this person has done this. You know, he likes a certain record. Oh, wow, you know, yeah, yeah, yeah. It gets the, you know, real close to him and everything. And yet the, if you had it, they could care less. So that um, flirting with the opposite sex is another problem or spending an inordinate time with somebody of the opposite sex, spending a lot of times at the office, and the office only has one other woman or another man, and the a jealous person can look and say, well, you know, they don't spend that kind of time with me. Maybe something is going on, and maybe it is, and maybe it isn't, but that would cause a problem. So there's a lot of good reasons for jealousy, some good and not, some not so good. Another um, cause that I see for jealousy is uh, on the part of the person that is being is jealous. He can be wanting to complete control over another person. And so you find a fault and become jealous because that person's spending some time or doing something uh, that you didn't want them to do. So your jealousness, jealous, jealousness would cause, um, would, would come out in because you want to control uh, the other person. Another possibility with jealousness would be from a lack of trust uh, from a previous experience uh, in your life or uh, to you or even could be like in your parents or a relative that did something that was bad that you saw that there there was uh, adulterous relations or whatever and it lined up to whatever you see your current spouse doing. So that can cause a 
uh, problem there in the, in the jealousy. But here, uh, it's the husband who is the initiator of the charge, which uh, the wife is the defendant. Now, this, I'm sure today, would give feminist causes for shuddering because of that. And, well, I, I, I would, it is what it is. And so, uh, if uh, he should be jealous of his wife and she should be defiled, or there should come upon him a spirit of jealousy and he should be jealous of his wife and she should not be defiled, then the man shall lead his wife to the priest. So goes into the temple area, or ta- tabernacle, I'm sorry. There was no t- temple, it's a tabernacle, the tent. And he shall bring the gift for her, the tenth of a ephah of flour of barley. So he takes a in a pot of some sort, and he shall not pour upon it olive oil, nor shall he place upon it frankincense, for it is a sacrifice of jealousy. Now I highlighted this because it's upon. If you had a p, then there's another ep. ep. Uh, whenever a vowel, normally it would be a p. If it was followed by a consonant, which would be a consonant would be like an L, a G, a, g- a gamma, a Z. If it was followed by a consonant, then it would be a, a P. If it doesn't, if it's followed by a vowel, then it's el- eluded, the I, iota, is eluded. So that's why I had this to show you that. So anyway, he shall not place these things for it as a sacrifice of, of, of zelotipias. And that word, again, does not appear in the New Testament. A sacrifice of memorial calling to mind sin. Serious thing. And the priest shall bring her, the wife, and stand her before the Lord. So she goes to the tabernacle, and I don't know where she would go, but anywhere, someplace there close to it, or inside, the, I'm not sure. And the priest uh, shall take clean living water. That means coming out of a well, uh, not a, I'm sorry, a well, a spring or a river or a stream that's running, not standing water. He shall take it in an earthenware receptacle, and some of the earth or ground, dirt being upon the floor. Uh, see, now here's a tav, and there's a P, T, tav, uh, being upon the floor of the tent of the testimony. So takes the uh, dirt and puts it there, and taking it, the dirt, the priest shall put it into the water. Uh, and that's, it should be italicized. And the priest shall take the woman before the Lord, and he shall uncover the head of the woman. They're generally where women wore head scarves, And shall give unto her hands the sacrifice of memorial, the sacrifice of jealousy. But in the hand of the priest will be the water of rebuke, accursing this. It's a water of rebuke, special water. And the priest shall adjure her. To, Jesus was adjured by Pontius Pilate. or, or No, it was a, um, Caiaphas, the high priest, that if he was the son of God, I adjure you, adjure. And it's a, sort of a legalistic term. And shall say to the woman, if no one has gone to bed with you, if you have not violated to be defiled, being under your own husband that's with somebody else, be innocent from this accursing by the water of rebuke. Then you're in it. You'll be innocent. But if you, uh, but if being married, you violated or were defiled, and gave of his marriage bed by you, that is with somebody besides your husband, then, then that's what he says the end of the quotation, then the priest shall bind the woman by the oaths of this uh, imprecation. Uh, do you agree to this? Do you, uh, this is it? This is it? Do you agree? Do you agree? Yes, 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 yes. And the priest shall say to the woman, may the Lord appoint you by a curse and solemn affirmation in the midst of your people in the Lord giving of your thigh to miscarry and your belly to bloat. And this accursing Water shall enter into your belly to bloat, pregnant, and to miscarry by your thigh. And the woman shall say, may it be, may it be. That is, if she's innocent. If she's not innocent and she says this, then she's saying it on, with the ground of the, of the tabernacle. Serious things. This is very, very serious. Today we don't have anything like this. And uh, so 
feminists may not like this whole situation, but it was the way God had set it up, and uh, it would give, um, it's a way of dealing with it, a difficult situation, but it would definitely <laughs> bring a problem to a halt or a, to a place where um, it would it would reach a climax. It wouldn't be something that's going on and jealousy is going on and on and eating a person and eating a person and causing a relationship to break down, the family to break down, just oh, on and on and on for a lifetime of marriage could be horrible. So you could look and say, well, which would you rather have? If you're a feminist, would you rather have freedom not to go and do this, but yet live in complete misery for all this and not having a way to deal with it? Or would you rather have this was a, a way of dealing with it that was uh, settled. And the woman shall say, may it be, may it be. And the priest shall write these imprecations on a scroll, vivlion, like a Bible comes from that, and shall wipe them away uh, into, uh, that O should be up here, into the water of the rebuke of the accursing. And wipe the, I don't know how he sorry, wipes the words into it, but whatever he does, scrapes it off. And he shall give to drink to the woman the water of a rebuke of the accursing, and shall enter into her the water of the rebuke of the accursing. And the priest shall take from out of the hand of the woman the sacrifice of jealousy, the epath of barley flour, and shall place the sacrifice before the Lord goes in there, and shall bring it upon unto the altar inside uh, the big altar where they kill the animals and cut and uh, sacrifice and burnt them, and then that altar. And the priest shall grab from the sacrifice its memorial and shall offer it upon the altar. And burns up to the Lord. And after these things, he will cause, he goes back out uh, to the woman to drink the water. And it shall be, if she should be defiled, and in forgetfulness her husband should be unaware, then shall enter into her the water of rebuke of a cursing, and the belly shall bloat and her thigh shall miscarry, and the woman will be for a curse to her people. But if, the, yeah, of course I can understand what you're going to say now, well, what happens if this happens and it's natural and she didn't do anything? You know, I don't know. But if the woman should not be defiled and should be clean, then she will be innocent and shall produce offspring of semen. Well, so the husband, you know, solves a problem. She's taken it and he's happy. So she's, uh, you know, claiming she's innocent. And so hopefully he will cease the jealousy and have children and be a long gone problem. Problem long gone. This is the law of Zelotipias in whichever a married wo woman, a, wo a woman being married should violate and should be defiled or a man, whoever should have a spirit of jealousy come upon him and should be jealous of his wife. Then he should stand his wife before the Lord, and the priest shall do to her all this law. Then the man will be innocent from sin, and that woman shall take the sin on herself. That is, if she was guilty. Interesting, isn't it? Um, with Jesus and today, um, marriage infidelity is rampant. Adultery and people aren't even getting married anymore. I suppose that's a <laughs> that's a backdoor way of solving the problem, huh? No, it's not really. But today is just uh, unclean, unclean, unclean. Everything is pretty much unclean. Uh, but if you are a married person, have a spouse, love them, do the things that would not cause them to be jealous. Don't spend time with them. Think about the reactions, what you do, what the other person can think, and so forth, uh, I think is a good advice. With that, hope you'll join us in our next video seminar, chapter six. Let's see what it is. It's a laws regarding vows of purity. So we'll find out about that and hope you'll join us. Until then, God bless.